Now let's continue on and see if we can get sort of a timeline on these by sequence of events. You can't set a time because we don't know the time. Now, right here in, Re in Revelation, we have just crossed the page. We have chapter 12. We have chapter 14. Okay. Let's come here to verse 6, chapter 14. And let's understand this. God always gives a warning before the event happens, correct? Yes. So, what we have with these three angels, these have to occur just before the enforcement of the mark of the beast, as we will see. And the enforcement of the mark of the beast, and I'll ring my bell, along with the pushing of the king of the south toward the king of the north, is probably the beginning of the tribulation. So let's read it beginning here in verse 6. Verse 6. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, and to every nation and tribe and language and people. Now that, exactly how that's going to be done, we don't know. But this means that every nation is going to hear it, and it's going to be to every people, and it's going to be in a language they can understand. Okay? And no one can say, oh, this is a warning from a man. He may be wrong. Okay, this is going to be a warning from an angel of God. And that's never wrong. So he's saying, verse 7, with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Then another angel followed, saying, The great city Babylon is fallen, is fallen. God always gives a warning before it happens. Because of the wine of the wrath of of her fornication, which she has given to all nations to drink. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worship the beast and his image, and receive the mark in his forehead or in his hand, he shall drink, he shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed, undiluted in the cup of his wrath. He shall be tormented in fire and brimstone in the sight of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment, not that they will be tormented, they'll be burned up. This is the smoke ascends into the ages of eternity. Once that smoke is up out of the atmosphere of the earth and gets into outer space, it just keeps going and going and going and going. Okay? And those who worship the beast and his image, and all who receive the mark of his name, have no rest day and night. Now notice verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are the ones who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Following right after these three. Okay? So this tells you the ones, the ones who are the saints, they keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Now we'll tie that together here in Revelation 12 in just a minute. But notice verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven say to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in Christ. From this time forward. 
That means those who refuse the mark of the beast. It doesn't say they'll all be taken to a place of safety. That's a different situation here. It says they die. There will be some in a place of safety, and we will examine that in just a minute, because we need to understand two things to counteract the rapture, which is that there is a place of safety, and it's not for the many. And you have to understand the order of the resurrection and the timing of that in order to know that they confuse the two of them. So we'll see that in a little bit. Okay. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Okay. Now come to chapter 12. Let's see that we can probably say pretty securely, it's all ring the bell, that at the time Satan is cast down from heaven and he goes to, after the church, persecutes the church, that is the beginning of the tribulation. And persecution will start because why? The saints refuse the mark of the beast. They are given strength to overcome the temptation that has come upon the whole world. The mark of the beast for every human being. All right, so let's see it here. Now let's pick it up here in verse 10. He's cast down his angels with him. And I heard a grace voice in heaven saying, Now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, because the accuser of our brethren has been cast down, who accuses them day and night before God. So that ties right in with the three angels' messages and ties right in with, Right blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from this time forward. Okay. But they overcame him through the blood of the Lamb, through the word of their testimony, because they're going to give a witness that it doesn't matter what you do to us, Christ is going to resurrect us, and they loved not their lives unto death. Okay. So obviously, they're not in a place of safety. <laughs> okay. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and those who dwell in them. Woe to those who inhabit the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has only a short time. So what is Satan's object at that time? Go after all of those who refuse to worship him. And when the dragon saw that he was cast down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who had brought forth the man-child. Now, remember this. Look back at what happened with the Jews during World War II. How did it happen with the Jews? Well, first of all, they were separated out and propagandized against. Next, they had to identify themselves with the yellow star. Next, they were prop propagandized again as to the lowest people on earth. And all the German people were seduced by that deception into believing what they were told. So then they came after them with a satanic benefit. If you get on the, if you want to live, we will give you land in the east where it will be all yours. And so what they did, they actually gave them cash. They actually told them, well, this is for your trip. They helped them with their baggage and their luggage. And the Jews actually believed that they were going to go someplace 
where they could be peaceable and away from all of the persecution. So this is what's going to happen to the Christians. Everyone is going to have to take a stand for Christ right here. See. And to keep us from that time of temptation may require our lives. Probably will because if you don't take the mark of the beast you're going to be killed. So here's the persecution. Now the persecution comes before the martyrdom. Just like it did with the Jews who were shipped off into Eastern Europe. All right. Verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast down to the earth, he persecuted the woman that brought forth the man-child, and two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman that she might fly to her place in the wilderness, where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. And a serpent cast water out of his mouth as a river so that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river that the dragon had cast out of his mouth. Now notice carefully verse 13. And the dragon was furious with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Not all escape martyrdom. And they were killed, just like it says in chapter 13. Okay? Now then, let's talk about and see the difference between Going to a place of safety, as identified here. First of all, let's finish in chapter chapter 12, so that we understand this. All right. Okay. Verse 14, chapter 12. Verse 14 cannot be a rapture. Why? It is a taking to a place of safety, but it's not a rapture to heaven. Why? Show me one scripture in the Bible which describes God's heaven as a wilderness. Wilderness is where? On the earth, because who helped the woman? The angels in heaven? No, the earth. So they're not going to heaven in a rapture. They're going to a place on earth that is called a wilderness. Now we don't know exactly where that is. So anyone who says they know where it is and they don't go there, they're going to be disappointed. Everyone who gets there who does not know where it is will know where it is when they arrive if they get there. So it's simple. One other little sidebar years ago because the church made that an idol in its mind that the church is going to go into a place of safety that people had their little Petra box because they thought it was Petra over in Jordan. And even one of the branch churches of God tried to buy Petra from the Jordanian government so they could guarantee that they could say that, well, we have the place of safety, we own it. <laughs> okay. See, you can't help God's prophecies along, okay? All right. Okay, probably what would happen, the government of Jordan would, would cancel the deed at the last minute. 
Okay, got to have a little humor. This is pretty heavy stuff. Okay. All right. So this is on the earth. All right. Now, why are some people taken to a place in the wilderness on the earth so that they will not die? Why? Let's come to Matthew 16. Okay. Now they may be very fine and very obedient to God. Probably are. Probably very faithful. God is the one who is going to do the selecting because God knows the heart and it's going to be done according to as God chooses. All right. Why are some kept alive? Because some are more righteous than others? No, let's read it here. Matthew 16 and verse 13. Verse 13, Matthew 16. Now, after coming into the parts of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus questioned his disciples, saying, Whom do men declare me the Son of Man to be? And they said, Some say, John the Baptist. See, there are rumors going around. <laughs> Did they have false answers back then, too, thinking they knew who, what, who he was? Yes. And others, Elijah. And others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said to them, But you, whom do you declare me to be? Then Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now this also tells us one thing. Do you think of a couple of verses in John the 6th chapter? How about John 14? None can come to the Father except through me. And you don't know the true Jesus until God reveals it through his word, correct? And calls you, correct? Okay, right there. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, that means son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but my Father who is in heaven. See, because anything we know or understand about the Word of God and the true meaning of it comes from God. Okay? And if it doesn't come from God, and we claim it comes from God, then we set ourselves up in place of God or in place of Christ. See? But I say also to you that you are Peter, which in the Greek means Petros, a little stone, a little rock. Now Jonathan draws plans for houses. Can you build a house on a little rock? No. The foundation will cover the whole thing, right? <laughs> but upon this rock, which means the Petra, the large, great stone, which is Christ himself, I will build my church. And the gates of the grave, says in the King James, hell. But that is grave shall not prevail against it. Which means the church would never die out. So at this time in history, what we're reading about in the book of Revelation that all of those who have the Spirit of God are going to be persecuted and killed, and the only way to fulfill that promise of Christ is to have some go to a place of safety. That's it. Okay. Now, let's come to Matthew 24. Let's see something here that is interesting too. Matthew 24. 
And there will be some of those there who may not be totally converted at that time. Here's the message to those who dwell in Jerusalem. All right. Let's read it. Matthew 24 and verse 15. There is coming an event that's going to take place which did not take place at the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. Verse 15, Matthew 24. Therefore, when you see, now that's for us today, the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, and put in your margin 2 Thessalonians 2, and John inserted in here because he didn't understand it. Jesus did not say the words in the parenthetical statement. John wrote that there, inspired insertion. The one who reads, let him understand, because he knew this was coming down in time. See? Then let those who are in Judea flee into the mountains. That's east. So there will be a lot of Jews who will escape. Now that's in addition to the ones of the church being taken there. See, So you have two classes of people. The Jews who escape and the church. Now let's see the instruction here that he gives. Let the one who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. So much for your Petra box. <laughs> And let the one who is in the field not go back to take his garments. But woe to those women who are expecting a child and those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight be not into winter nor on the Sabbath. For then shall be great tribulation. That's when it starts. Such as not has been from the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be again. All right. But what about those who go? Let's come to Luke 17. Let's look at something very interesting here. Luke 17. Now this talks about those who go to a place of safety. Now part of the thing with the rapture is this. That there is going to be a voice heard only by those who are Christians. And when they hear that voice, they're going to be raptured up into heaven. And at that time, millions of people will mysteriously leave the world. There will be car crashes, plane crashes. There will be all kinds of disasters take place because so many people will be taken up in the rapture. Okay? That's not how it's going to work. Okay? Luke 17. Now let's pick it up here in verse 20. Now when the Pharisees demanded of him when the kingdom of God would come because they wanted to be in the political machinery of it. And the thing they didn't like about Jesus was he never came to them. And when he did, whoopee. <laughs> he corrected them vociferously, didn't he? Yes. Read Luke 7 and Luke 11. Okay. He answered and said to them, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. It comes when God determines it's going to come. Neither shall they say, behold, it is here, which they will say it, but that is, say it with meaning that it's actually there. Or behold, it is there. 
For behold, the kingdom of God is standing in the midst of you. That's the meaning of it. Jesus himself. Now, of course, he spoke this in such a way they wouldn't understand it. Because they didn't believe him anyway. So can you imagine them scratching their heads after that? Because how can this man be the kingdom of God when he came from Galilee? They didn't check <laughs> the chronology. He was born in Bethlehem, just like the prophecy said. Then he said to his disciples, The days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and shall not see it. Okay? And they shall say to you, Look here or look there. Do not go, neither follow them. Because here is how Christ is going to come. Verse 24. For as the light of day whose light shines from one end of heaven to the other end under heaven, so also shall the Son of Man be in his day. That's when his coming is going to be. But what is going to happen next is what's going to take place before that occurs. But first... That's what he said. It is necessary for him to suffer many things and to be rejected by this generation. Now as it was in the days of Noah, so, shall, uh, so also shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. In the same way as it was in the days of Lot's, days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. Probably had same-sex marriage there too, so I'll ring the bell. Okay. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and sulfur from heaven and destroyed them all. This is how it shall be in the day that the Son of Man shall be revealed. And he still didn't clarify it, did he? What is the revelation of the Son of Man? Okay. Is it going to be when the tribulation starts? Probably. Because that's the first thing that starts all the rest of it coming. All right, now notice. Talks about Lot. That's how it's going to be, verse 30. In that day, let not the one who is on the housetop and his goods in the house come down to take them away. Likewise, let not the one who is in the field return to bring the things behind. Okay, remember Lot's wife. Whoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night, now he comes to something entirely different than just fleeing to the mountains. Okay? There shall be two in one bed. One shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. One shall be taken. The other shall be left. Two men shall be in the field. One shall be taken. The other shall be left. Now what are they doing? They're doing their ordinary things, aren't they? Now this has to tie in with when Satan is cast down and then there are those who are taken to a place of safety. God makes the choice. What do we also have? If you look at it from God's point of view, looking down on the earth, we have in one place night. We have in another place grinding together that generally early in the morning. We have another place working in the field that's in the daytime. 
So this is giving us a worldwide perspective. Some are taken at night, some are taken in the morning, some are taken in the daytime. So that means those who are taken will all be taken at once. And there may be some who think they're going to go, but they're not going to go. Now that is being taken to a place of safety. This is the closest that you can get to a rapture, but it is not a rapture in the sense that it's taught by Protestants. This is to the few that God selects. So who that will be, we don't know. But, after they are taken, God strengthens the ones who remain with strength because they know that they have to give a testimony unto death. So when that happens, God will give whoever it is the strength to do it. Because you will know by that time all the events that are taking place. All right, now let's come to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. And let's look at this, because here is where they get a lot of confusion concerning a rapture. Now, when we begin next time, we'll come back and review this. However, let's understand this. We need to look at the way that it is written. And this happens many, many, many times in the Bible. It tells you a summary of everything first, and then it gives you the details after that. It's not a double sequencing of things. It is a summary first, then the details. Okay? Now let's pick it up here in verse 13. But I do not wish you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, that is, died in Christ. That you be not grieved, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again in exactly the same way also, those who have fallen asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now it sounds like they're in heaven. If you stop right there. But they are not. Why? Because as we will see, 1 Corinthians 15 says, Christ, the first fruits, those who are Christ's at his coming. See? So they're not in heaven. See? So you have to put together the resurrection, the sea of glass meeting Christ in the air, because this scripture is not definitive. See? It's a summary. Now then, he begins to explain it in verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall in no wise precede those who have fallen asleep. Which tells you what? That if you believe in a rapture, the resurrection will take place before you're raptured if you're alive, right? So it's a contradictory belief. A deception with a subtle manipulation of scriptures. Because the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's not a rapture. See, Okay, hold your place right here. Revelation 11. Let's see that. There is one trumpet. It's not trumpets. It's the seventh trumpet. Verse 15, 
Revelation 11. This is when this will take place. Okay? Verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were, were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign into the ages of eternity. And the twenty-four elders who sit before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, who is and who was and who is to come, for you have taken to yourself your great power and have reigned. For the nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that you should give reward to your servants, to prophets, and to the saints, that's all of those in the first resurrection, and to those who fear God, who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. Okay? That's the trumpet. Now then, Come back to 1 Thessalonians 4. So they have everything out of sequence because if you say that, you are going to hear the voice of God come up here and you will be wafted up into heaven. Okay? It's totally out of sequence there, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Okay? This is talking about the resurrection. Verse 17 now. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds for the meeting with the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Now that projects out where? Into all eternity, yes? See? Okay. Now the meeting's going to be on the sea of glass. We've already covered that with Pentecost. And that's going to be quite a thing. Quite, quite a thing. Okay. Now then. This does not teach a rapture. No one is going to go to meet Christ in the air until the trumpet has been sounded and the dead first will rise. Those who are alive, as we'll cover next time in 1 Corinthians 15, will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, and we shall be changed at that time. So those who are alive, that transformation is going to constitute an instant death and resurrection. Because the physical body will be gone. You will have a spiritual body to replace it, even though it's built on the foundation of the physical body. Okay? So the old body is dead. Well, we'll go ahead and pick it up here next time.